unlike Vince, uh, I don't have any exciting things to show you. But I, I think I can get away with it because if you want to hear about the sweet midge, it's a really good story. We do not have it in Alberta, so that's the end of my presentation on the sweet midge. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I guess there's one thing we should we should uh, keep in mind about the sweet midge. Uh, it, it is a pest that has been found in Saskatchewan, and it, it is a very uh, serious concern because the the strain that has uh, invaded Ontario is actually quite aggressive, and it's, it's uh, I guess we're worried about it. In Saskatchewan, it's now in the northeast and in the northwest, and it seems to be spreading. They are finding it in various uh, places, so it's quite likely that it will, at some point, it will come to Alberta. Uh, but the good news is that it does not seem to be as aggressive as the strain that they have in Ontario, so uh, hopefully it will not become a major pest in our region. We already have too many, and I don't want to start working on another one. But what we should look for is uh, the easiest thing to identify and find out if we have it or not in our fields is to look for the damage. And the damage is actually quite easy to identify. If you should look for fused petals at the flower stage of canola. And if you uh, see these kind of bell-shaped uh, petals and they're, they're not going to open, uh, open, open them yourself and you will find these uh, white little maggots in there and the, uh, the sweet midge is uh, close relative to the wheat midge. Uh, the arrows actually look fairly similar. They're related to the mosquitoes. Uh, the larva are these little tiny white uh, maggots. Uh, there's a few that you will find inside that little bell-shaped uh, canola petal structure that uh, is formed by the, by the larva. So that's what you need to look for, and hopefully you will not find it. Okay, I'd like to spend uh, just a couple minutes about other bad news that actually are real bad news uh, that we do have around, and that is uh, uh, some of our insects that uh, invade and are a risk. They pose a risk to canola this time, and uh, the ligus bug is probably the, the main one that we will be worried about. And I'm actually going to use this... Uh, this background here as an example. Okay, this, this canola probably was planted at uh, sometime in early May, and that canola over there was planted after the Victoria long weekend, probably, right? Hold on, little patch. Yeah. Go yes. <laughs> okay, so there is a, a very significant effect of uh, seeding date or crop stage on the risk of insect damage. And uh, over the last four years, we did a study with many growers looking at seaport weevil and how spraying for seaweed weevils affected ligus bugs. And there was, it was very clear that the fields that were planted early were uh, usually invaded by seaweed weevils, and those that were planted uh, a little bit later would not have seaweed weevils, but they would be invaded by ligus bugs. And uh, that's something to keep in mind. If you, if you planted late and your canola is in flower, you probably will have a worry with ligus. Ligos are, are native insects. Uh, we have uh, at least four species in Alberta. Uh, in our region, we only worry mostly about Ligos keltoni, and in northern Alberta, they worry about a different species. But they they are a concern. They're always there. Uh, if if we take uh, ten sweeps in this field, we probably will find that there's probably five to ten, maybe twenty. Uh, have you swept this field, Ken? Or is Ken? Yeah. Yeah. Have you find any Ligos here? few, uh, but you probably found them, they're, they're small ligos, right? Most of them are small, so that's important also. If, uh, if the ligos bugs that you find, you cannot see the wing buds on them, then they are not causing damage yet. Uh, they cannot really penetrate the pod and actually start feeding on the seeds. It's only those that have the wing buds developed and you can actually see the black spots on them and the adults that are actually the problem. If you had sampled this field in early flower, in mid-flower, you would have found on the adults. And we do not recommend that you spray at flower for ligos because those ligos have already died. And the ones that may cause damage is the, the new generation of, uh, of the babies and only when they're old enough. So uh, last, uh, I think a couple of days ago, somebody asked me this question and I think it's worth answering and repeating here. Uh, if you have, say, up to five ligus per sweep and the crop is about 10 days from swathing, 
but the, the majority of the ligus are very small, should you spray or not? Uh, that's a kind of a, a bit of a tough question. It depends on the weather in part. Uh, if you get a strong thunder shower, uh, you can thank Mother Nature because uh, the, the rainfall, if it comes down fast, it will actually wash them down and they will actually get eaten by Vince's, Vince's predators and uh, he will tell you more about those. But uh, we have seen this happen many occasions. Uh, the ligus bugs are actually, they don't really tolerate a lot of humidity very well. They, they drown, they get washed down and then on the ground they get eaten by karabi beetles and spiders. So that's one thing that may reduce the risk. Uh, the other thing is that if, uh, if the crop advances quickly, then they will escape damage by LIGO. So what I usually recommend in a situation like that is to actually wait for uh, uh, about a week, because that's how long it will take for the baby LIGOs to reach the damaging stage. And if you still have very large numbers, and the, the economic threshold right now is about two LIGOs per sweep at that mid-pod stage, uh, some of the research we have done, and we are doing a case study to elevate this research on the new cultivars, it suggests that the plants can actually tolerate much higher levels. So I think our thresholds are a little bit low, and we probably will end up uh, increasing them uh, by quite a bit. Uh, that's kind of a preliminary message at this point. So yes, you will find ligos. Ligos are native species, but they are not necessarily causing damage to the crop. So there's no need to get too uh, excited and start spraying them right away because remember that when you spray, you're also going to, to reduce the population of beneficial wasps and all the uh, generalist predators in the field. So that's, I think, all I want to say about ligos. Uh, the question about ligos? Or? You said a heavy rainfall washing away. What about irrigation? Oh, yes. The person that, uh, that phoned me last week asked me about that also. Uh, I don't think irrigation, unless you have the older irrigation system that put a lot of water, I think this mist, I don't think it's enough to actually wash them down, but that's something that I would like to do more research on in the future to actually look at the, the tolerance of irrigated canola versus dry canola, because I suspect that we sometimes tend to uh, overspray in irrigation when the plants are actually growing better because they have moisture and they can actually tolerate insect feeding a lot more than in dryland crops. But, but somebody said data is king, I think, uh, who said that just a while ago, and I think that's uh, it's really important to have the data to actually convince you. I want to mention very quickly uh, other insects that you may find at the pod stage, like this one, uh, diamondback moth. This is actually the stage when we should be concerned if we have diamondback moth. Uh, uh, at the flower stage, sometimes we... we um, get too excited when we sweep for uh, ligos or for weevils and we actually find many diamondback moth larvae but I, I like to remind you that the threshold for diamondback moth, diamond moth larvae is about 20 to 30 per square feet right uh, and sometimes we translate that to about two or three per plant but it's it's really not a good idea to only collect individual plants because just just our own human nature will actually you know, you take a plant and then you actually spot another one that has a larva and then you, that's not a, a good way to actually get the threshold estimation. It's uh, much better to take the, an actual square foot, take all the plants in that square foot, shake them, and then count how many you have. And you will find a very different number than if you just take individual plants. Same thing applies for uh, a Berta army worm, which is a potential uh, concern in a, a few areas. I think we are on the on the down cycle for the outbreak that we, we saw in the prairies uh, the last few years. Uh, but again, is a threshold that is based on a, an area, not individual plants. So it's much better to actually take all the plants in the square foot and do a few of those to estimate the threshold. Um, I think that's all I wanted to say. Ken. I just have a quick question. We had a producer find some bugs out in the foremost area and they were identified as a cottonwood leaf beetle. Oh. Uh, I don't think so. I bet I bet uh, Vince will know more about the cottonwood leaf beetle. Yeah, I know this beetle is not a pest. It feeds only on uh, cottonwood uh, poplars. Yeah. Okay. See, Vince is a real entomologist. Uh, when he was four years old, he was already walking with a sweep net in his hands. Unlike me, who uh, who like to kill bugs more than uh, collect them. <laughs>